My sense is that in our generation, we're no longer hearing so much about a rich theology of what preaching is. Oh, for sure, we talk often about preaching. We hear a lot about exegesis, and that is a good thing. But I don't think that we are today digging enough like past generations did into a deep, rounded theology of preaching. And, you know, it is fitting that we can do it this year for this is the 50th anniversary of Martin Lloyd-Jones delivering his preaching and preachers. And it's that theology of preaching that I want to press into in our session now. So let's start by thinking about what the nature of God tells us about preaching. Now, when Luther came to comment on Jesus' words in John 16, Jesus said in John 16, 13, whatever the Spirit hears he will speak. And Luther commented with these words. Christ refers to a conversation carried on in the Godhead, a conversation in which no creatures participate. He sets up a pulpit. He makes the Father, the preacher, and the Holy Spirit the listener. Luther is saying, God the Father is, as it were, an eternal preacher. And the Holy Spirit has been eternally listening. Before any creatures were brought into being, the Holy Spirit was enjoying the ultimate sermon. A sermon that he now shares with us. And preaching, friends, starts here on the basis that God is not silent or speechless. In fact, the living God is a God who speaks and more, he cannot be wordless. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Before all things, God had a word to speak. So here is a God who does not merely happen to speak. By his very nature, he is a speaking God. And that immediately has an application for us. It means, <coughs> brother preachers... We are not the hirelings of a God who's incapable of or unwilling to do his own teaching and publicity. Which it's easy to think when life's tough. As if God sits back, lounges back and entertains himself with angel songs while we go out on the stump. No, preaching is a natural expression of God's identity. The spirit who speaks what he's heard enables preachers to join in with God's own proclamation of his son. And so to preach Christ is to participate in the life of God. The speaking God. Now, since the word is God, the word held out by the Father. It means that when God speaks, he communicates nothing less than his very self. Which is why in the Old Testament, God's word is described as the creative power of God. The means by which he reveals himself, the means of God's healing and deliverance. It is why when the word of God goes out, the glory of God shines out. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give us the light 
of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Makes you think Hebrews 1, God speaking to us is tightly connected to the Son being the radiance of God's glory. It means that in speaking, God, hear me carefully here, God holds out more than, not less than, but more than information and propositions. The word of God brings the presence of God. When the word of God comes to us, it is God himself in all his life-giving glory who comes to be with us. And that, friends, is a truth we need to hear, especially in tough ministries where a, a wearying negativity or defeatism has set in. Because it's so easy, isn't it, to think, given all the opposition, given all the apathy, we seem so beleaguered. We seem so small and insignificant, and so we can circle the wagons, lose confidence in the old word of God, look elsewhere for the silver bullet. But because of who God is, preachers can know we are not the mere teachers of some unfashionable message. We are not salesmen of one religious product. Preachers herald the word who is God. And this is the word that, in the darkness, brought light, life, and creation into being. The word that now brings new creation into being. The word entrusted to the preacher. Hear the weight of this is the very power of God that does not return empty but will one day drive all darkness away for good. And seeing how God speaks is what gives us a fundamental framework to any theology of preaching. God the Father is the prime preacher who speaks his word and so communicates himself in the power of the Spirit. And that is the foundation on which the content, the form, and the goal of truly Christian preaching must be built. And it means, I'm going to say three things. The first thing it means is this. Since God in his speaking, does not merely give information about himself, since he actually gives himself, the Christian preacher must know he is about more than the transferal of information. And to illustrate, I'd like to compare what we might call a Zwinglian and a Calvinist view of preaching. So the Zurich reformer Ulrich Zwingli taught that in the Lord's Supper, Christ's body is not present in any sense, but only memorialized. Okay? Body's not present in any sense, only symbolized. So, so the Lord's Supper is a memorial pointing to a truth elsewhere. <coughs> if we take that logic into preaching, in the same way, the point of the sermon, like the supper, is to serve as a memorial to God's word. It brings God's word fresh to mind. You remember God's word. That's it. Now, that idea of preaching is in stark contrast. That memorial of God's word, remembering old truths is in contrast to what was articulated by his successor, Heinrich Bullinger, in Zurich, and then championed by John Calvin in Geneva. So Bullinger, when writing the second Helvetic Confession, 
boldly stated, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God, which requires a bit of clarification to avoid confusion. So let me clarify. Bullinger, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Bullinger never meant that the words of the preacher have the same standing and authority as scripture. Scripture never bows to the preacher. The preacher must bow to scripture. His preaching depends on the word of God in its supreme authority. The word preached in the pulpit is authoritative only in so far as it's a faithful proclamation of the word of God. But in so far as it is faithful, the people hear the very word of God. And though, so the Christian faithful are told in Hebrews, remember your leaders who spoke to you the word of God. And come now to Calvin himself. Calvin believed that through preaching, the very creative voice and word of God would be heard. Not simply memorialized or remembered or talked about, but actually heard. So preaching on uh, 1 Timothy 3.2, that an overseer must be able to teach, Calvin declared, wonderful words for a preacher to hear, St. Paul does not mean that one should just make a parade here or that a man should show off so that everyone applauds him and says, oh, well spoken, oh, what a breadth of learning, oh, what a subtle mind. Well, that is beside the point. When a man has climbed up into the pulpit, is it so that he may be seen from afar, that he may be preeminent? Not at all. It is that God may speak to us by the mouth of a man. And he does us that favor of presenting himself there and wishes a mortal man to be his messenger. In another place, Calvin said, when a man is the envoy, the ambassador of his prince, he has complete authority to do what's committed to his charge, he will, so to say, borrow the prince's name. He will say, we are doing this. We instruct, we've commanded, we want this done. Now, when he speaks like this, he's not intending to take anything from his master. And so it is with God's servants. It is said, ministers are sent to enlighten the blind, to deliver the captives, to forgive sins, to convert hearts. What? I love having Calvin. What? To his own statement, these are things which belong to God alone. For there is nothing more properly his own than to pardon sins. He also reserves to himself the converting of the heart. And now, nevertheless, it is the case. He imparts these qualifications to those whom he appoints to convey his word and declares to them he does not separate himself from them, but rather shows he uses them as his hands and his instruments. So, for Calvin, preaching, brothers, is not a merely educative exercise. It is not a mere repetition of truths. When the gospel is preached, its reality is present and effective in the power of the Spirit. And so we do not simply declare that God is gracious in a sermon. As his word goes out, God is being gracious. We do not simply declare that Christ died for our sins. Before the eyes of our people, Jesus Christ is set forth, placarded before them. And young preachers... Young preachers, this, maybe old preachers too, this is what helps with nerves, fear of the crowd. Because as you stand up in front of others, they are not to be looking to you, but to him. 
And so know your task. And I see this again and again and again with young preachers. They talk about the fear, the nerves of standing in front of the people. And I always like to ask why. Well, because they're looking at me. Oh, that's the problem, isn't it? You think they're looking at you. (laughs) Know your task. Obsessed with heralding him. And nerves will begin to evaporate as concern for him eclipses concern for yourself. So preaching is about more than information delivery. But second, this theology of preaching gives us clarity on our content. Because what is the content of God's speaking? Does God speak to entertain, to moralize, to philosophize? (coughs) No. The one held out by the Father, the one to whom the spirit of truth testifies, is the eternal Son who comes from the Father full of grace and truth. He is the truth and glory of God. In him the grace of God is found. And that is why the law finds its fulfillment in him. That's why the apostles, the prophets, all the scriptures testify about him. So Calvin wrote in his little preface to French translation of the New Testament, he said, this is what we should in short seek in the whole of scripture, truly to know Jesus Christ and the infinite riches that are comprised in him and are offered to us by him from God the Father. If, Calvin said, if one were to sift thoroughly through the law and the prophets, you'd not find a single word which would not draw and bring us to him. And for a fact, since all the treasures of wisdom and understanding are hidden in him, there is not the least question of having or turning towards another goal, not unless we deliberately turn aside from the light of truth to lose ourselves in the darkness of lies, and therefore, rightly does St. Paul say, he would know nothing except Jesus Christ. And him crucified. Friends, if the desire of the Father, the work of the Spirit, and the purpose of Scripture is to make Jesus known, so too the preacher must seek to draw and bring us to him. Now I say that there is actually a lot of talk about preaching Christ today. But I think mostly what's meant by that is the exegetical question of how you get to Christ, especially if you're preaching on the Old Testament. And that's a good question to ask. But this theology of preaching is actually teaching something more fundamental than that. We are to preach Christ not merely in the sense of getting to him as the idea at the end of the exegetical puzzle. Now, like the Father, we are to hold him out in all his glory so that people wonder and love and trust him and adore him. And that is why Spurgeon preferred to speak of preaching Christ rather than preaching the truth or preaching the gospel as a phrase because he knew how easily we reduce the gospel or the truth to an impersonal even Christless system now as God sends out his son as the life and delight of the saints as the bridegroom that the bride is called to enjoy so preachers are to send him out in our preaching. And that brings us to our third lesson from this theology of preaching. Preachers are to share God's own aim and goal in the sending forth of the word. Because God has a goal in sending out his word. It's... Phrased in many different ways in Scripture, 
But in his high priestly prayer, Jesus said this at the very end, John 17, verses 25 and 26. O righteous Father, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known. That, here's the purpose, here's the aim, here's the goal, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. And so the Son makes the Father known that we might share his life of knowing the Father, being loved by the Father, and loving the Father as the Son does. And it means that the knowledge of God that the word of God brings is not a mere cerebral cognition. We preach to minds, but our preaching is not Christ-like if we are content for truths to stop there merely flitting in the brain. This God is not truly known where he's not truly loved. He is so glorious, he cannot be known without being adored. God is not truly known where some mere facts about him are understood. The devils have that kind of sterile and loveless knowledge. And for the preacher, it means a sermon cannot be confused with a simple lecture. There is a difference between preaching and teaching. I've been asked about what is the difference, and I say, at Union, I teach heresy. But I don't preach heresy. Because I want students to understand Arianism, Pelagianism, Nestorianism, but I don't want them to believe it. I want them to hate false teaching out of love for Christ. So I teach it so they can understand it, but I don't preach it so that they love it. Spurgeon said, give us sermons and save us from essays. It meant in the pulpit, Spurgeon wasn't merely about informing his listeners about the word of God, He was seeking to draw believers and unbelievers to Christ. His aim is to see people transformed at the level of their affections. Their desires turned away from their naturally cherished sins to Christ. He said, the object of all true preaching is the heart. We aim at divorcing the heart from sin and wedding it to Christ. So Spurgeon seeing the preacher has a greater responsibility, brothers. A responsibility that demands a deeper integrity. God shares knowledge of himself that we might be affected. Preaching should foster sincere worship. And it is Not your hectoring, but worship that is most transformative for the Christian. Because it is love for God that fuels love for neighbor. Let me read you something quite brilliant on this from Jonathan Edwards. Um, Edwards lived in a day when most people would have had a theoretical knowledge of at least some Christian basics. But such knowledge, Edwards was clear, didn't make them Christian. Devils have that kind of knowledge. Instead, he said, true religion in great part consists in holy affections. The motion of the blood, the animal spirits, begins to be sensibly altered to love for Christ and joy in him. And he said, This is why God has ordained preachers. I'm going to read you a little quotation now. This is why God has ordained preachers. The impressing of divine things on the hearts and affections of men is one great and main end for which God has ordained 
that his word delivered in the Holy Scriptures should be opened, applied, set home upon men in preaching. And therefore, it don't answer the aim. Yeah, that's what he wrote. Therefore, it don't answer the aim which God had in this institution merely for men to have good commentaries and expositions on the scripture and other good books of divinity. Because although these may tend as well as preaching to give men a good doctrinal, speculative understanding of the things of the word of God, they do not have an equal tendency to impress them on men's hearts and affections. God has appointed a particular lively application of his word to men in the preaching of it, as a fit means to affect sinners with the importance of the things of religion, with their own misery, with the necessity of a remedy, with the glory, the sufficiency of a remedy provided and to stir up the minds of the saints and to quicken their affections by bringing the great things of religion and setting them before the people, I love this, in their proper colors. Although they already know them and have been fully instructed in them already and particularly to promote these two affections, love and joy. So as Edward saw it, preaching is not less than, but it is more than exposition. It involves lively application, the intent to quicken affections by setting the things of the gospel before the people in their proper colors, which isn't emotionalism. This isn't emotional manipulation he's talking about. Edwards would helpfully distinguish between our passing superficial passions, which come and go with blood sugar levels, and affections, which are deep matters of the grain of the heart and its inclinations. No, Edwards isn't advocating whipping up the crowds. He wanted preachers to do far more weighty work, to aim the gospel at the basic desires and deepest loves of the human heart. Put it another way, we preach so that men and women might fear God. Now I need to explain that. The fear of God, says Ecclesiastes 12, 13, is the whole duty of man. John Murray called the fear of God the soul of godliness. It is a phrase that stands in scripture for truth, faithfulness, and the whole worship of God. But it is very misunderstood. Right? So let's be clear. The fear of God, which is a new covenant blessing, Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah 33, It's a new covenant blessing for believers. It really does not mean being afraid of God. In fact, it's the opposite of being afraid of God. The fear of God is not the minor key gloomy flip side to proper joy in God. It is all about proper enjoyment of God. Because Christ himself, Isaiah 11, delights, delights, in the fear of the Lord. And it is something that he shares with us. So the right fear of the Lord is the reaction of God's children to their father, overwhelmed by his goodness and his majesty and his holiness and his grace and his righteousness. By all that God is, the faithful In scripture and throughout the history of the church, the faithful find themselves trembling before God in loving and joyful wonder, rejoicing and trembling. And I mention this because the fear of the Lord is a vital theme for the preacher 
to have in mind. For it helps us to see the sort of love that the word of God produces in believers. The fear of God shows us that God does not want mere passionless performance or a vague preference for him. To encounter the living, holy, all gracious God truly will mean we cannot contain ourselves. Will mean we will fall at his feet. Because he's not a truth to be known unaffectedly. A good to be received listlessly. Seen clearly the sheer beauty and splendor of God must cause our hearts to quake. Now friends, if that is the aim of God's word, that we might love God with such a fearful adoration, if that is the aim, it throws out some mighty challenges for preachers. It means first, we preachers must ourselves first have that weak need humbled rejoicing wonder at God not mimicking it with outward show fear of God language can lead us to think merely behaving in outwardly reverent ways will do it no, the fear of God in scripture is a matter of the heart And so the fear of God should be something that perhaps you can't name, but will be beautifully Christ-like in the atmosphere around the preacher. The preacher should be clearly affected, honestly affected, by the glory and majesty and goodness of God. Because the fact is, you will not preach the gospel any better than you've experienced it yourself. You will not bring others to fear and delight in and love God more than you do normally. Which is why James Stewart said, the inner life makes the preacher. We talk about preparing sermons and we should. We also need to talk about preparing the preacher. Because a hollow man and an empty man can coolly articulate some biblical truths, but he will not make a fruitful preacher. We preachers must prayerfully prepare ourselves. And we do it under under the sweet light of the gospel, which is balm for us who are broken. So preparing ourselves is not a chin up and do better. It's putting ourselves as broken people back under the gospel. Under the light of the gospel, we need to start afresh every day, sharing Christ's fearful delight in his father. And so sharing his compassion for sinners, for his people, then the word will come from us hot from the oven. It'll come with the aroma of God's own passion and intent. Then we'll find the right tone to convey God's word. What a mighty challenge. But what a thrilling challenge for us who long to be rid of our sin and our spiritual cloddishness. Friends, we need the fear of God to make us preachers of integrity. And lastly, we need the fear of God to shape the goal of our preaching. In Deuteronomy 6, Moses said that he taught that the people might fear the Lord. That's why he taught. So we cannot be content merely to transmit information as we teach. We cannot be content with that. There is no true knowledge of God where there is no true fear of God. 
a delighted, wondering, trembling, rejoicing before him. If we are to share God's heart in preaching, brothers, we cannot preach in such a way that allows for indifference. The word of God in Psalm 19 is described as being itself the fear of the Lord. It's one of the descriptions of scripture. It is the fear of the Lord. For it conveys the fear of the Lord. You drink in this wonderful Christ's own delight in his father through scripture. But if scripture itself can be described as the fear of the Lord, it cannot go out listlessly. It cannot be rightly received unaffectedly. We preachers must share the fiery intent of God's word. To preach so that sinners tremble. And so that the hearts of the saints no longer quake in doubting dread. We preach so that the hearts of the saints quake in wonder. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would make us preachers of integrity, who fear your name and who are therefore fearless before men. Thank you for giving us the honor of wielding the very power of God to raise dead sinners and to comfort the saints. Thank you for the privilege of sharing your own heralding of the word. And we pray, help us to preach your awesome magnificence so that your people become themselves like you, awesome as an army with banners. In Jesus' great name, amen.